ain't gonna lie, today's video is kind of weird. We're gonna watch this video explaining what happens to cannibals in prison. Now, I'm not gonna lie, that's a very interesting topic. But with that being said, let's just watch the video. Psychopath, lunatic, crazy. These are names we use when describing serial killers. However, murderers who go ahead to eat their victims are a different kind of crazy. Needless to say, they strike fear into the hearts of ordinary citizens. But what happens when they get locked up? Do they live in constant fear for their lives? Do they become targets and have to live looking over their shoulders? Or are they also feared by their fellow inmates? Let's find out what really happens to cannibals in prison. I can Jeffrey tell this is going to be a good video, bro. I can already tell, bro. Jeffrey Dahmer, the serial killer and cannibal whose saga of evil has been given new life in the hit Netflix series Monsters. He is pure evil, but you'd never know it by looking at him. But when you hear him, that's another story. His killing field was Milwaukee, and he got away with murder for more than a decade. Jeffrey Lionel Dahmer is arguably the most famous cannibal in history. From his nicknames... Yo, I'm gonna be honest. I don't know that much about Jeffrey Dahmer. I know he's like one of the most uh, famous mass murderers, but I really don't know a lot about the guy. I haven't really done my research or watched the documentary or none of that because I'm not really that into true crime. I think, bro, I get chills watching that shit, but... I'm gonna watch this and I'm gonna see what they have to Milwaukee say. Milwaukee cannibal or the Milwaukee monster. It's clear as day that he caused the residents of Milwaukee sleepless nights with 17 deaths to his name. Jeffrey Dahmer could only. I know the guy was a cannibal though. Be described as a heartless monster. So who exactly was Jeffrey Dahmer? What triggered him to become the monster that he turned out to be? How was he arrested? And what was his life in jail like? Jeffrey Dahmer was born May 21st, 1960 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Much has been said about his parents and their possible role in creating the monster that everyone now knows. His dad, Lionel Herbert Dahmer, was a chemistry student and later a research chemist. During most of Dahmer's childhood, his dad's studies kept him away from his son. This means that he spent a lot of time with his mom, Joyce Annette Dahmer, a teletype machine instructor. Dahmer's mom had her fair share of troubles as she suffered from depression, demanded constant attention, and spent an increasing amount Damn. of time in bed. Therefore, neither parent devoted much time to their son. At elementary school, Dahmer was regarded as quiet and timid, meaning he had few friends. Interestingly, from an early age, Dahmer manifested an interest in dead animals. According to his dad, Dahmer was oddly thrilled by the sound the bones made and became so preoccupied with animal bones that one time he even asked what would happen. That's kind of a weird thing, weird, interesting thing. Happen if chicken bones were placed in bleach from his freshman year at Revere High School. Wait, what kid would even think about that, bro? What the hell? What would happen if I put a chicken bone in bleach um. Dahmer was seen as an outcast as his troubles at home got the better of him and he finally fell into alcohol his parents constantly fought leading them to finally get a divorce in 1978 it was that same year that Dahmer would murder his first victim a hitchhiker named Stephen Mark Hicks just three wait before we continue guys you know when it comes to these mass murders and these cycles does it all begin at home is it mostly because of child neglect and bad parenting and stuff like that or can it happen when you get raised by good parents and in a healthy household? I really want to know what you guys have to say. Because I'm not really sure, bro. I'm not really that educated in the topic, but... Yeah. Three weeks after his graduation from high school, this murder set him on a path that would see him take 16 more lives. According to Dahmer, he began to actively wait, seek wait, 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 hold on. Path that would see him take 16 more lives. According to bro, they're all niggas. What the hell? They're all black people. To Dahmer, he began to actively seek victims, most of whom he encountered in or around gay bars, and would typically lure them to his grandmother's home in West Allis, Wisconsin. He would drug his victims, and once they were unconscious, he strangled them to death. He would then dismember their bodies and dispose of the remains of- Hold on, that's some twisted shit, bro. I know a lot of people find this shit super entertaining, like the true crime fans, but I just get chills watching that shit, bro. Just thinking about it. That's crazy, bro. I wonder what it takes for someone to get to that thought process, bro. I'm I'm super curious. Let's just the watch trash. the video. My bad However, for pausing. He retained their skulls before pulverizing them several months later. So sick was the Milwaukee monster that he sometimes kissed and talked to the severed heads of his victims while he dismembered huh? the remainder of their bodies. Donald's oh, hell reign of no. terror would come to an end on July 22nd, 1991. After his attempt to kill his 18th victim, Tracy Edwards, failed, and he was subsequently arrested. 
Milwaukee police found body parts in a north side apartment and now they wonder if they've uncovered some kind of death factory. Police That's found some... parts of bodies. Oh my gosh. To believe the man they arrested is a mass murderer. Surprisingly, Dahmer waived his right to have a lawyer present throughout his interrogations, adding he wished to confess to his crimes. According to him, he had created this horror and wanted to do everything to put an end to it. The Milwaukee monster even confessed to having consumed the hearts, liver, biceps, and thighs of some of his victims. Ah, <sighs> bro. <laughs> That's insane, bro. People like this exist? Dahmer was charged and later pleaded guilty in court. The courtroom was filled with drama during Dahmer's sentencing as his victims' families expressed their grief. There was more shock as Dahmer's attorney announced his client wished to address the court. Dahmer then approached a lectern and read from a statement prepared by himself and his defense as he faced the judge. I didn't ever want freedom. Frankly, I wanted death for myself. This was a case to tell the world that I did what I did not for reasons of hate. I hated no one. I knew I was sick or evil or both. Now I believe I was sick. Wait, that's pretty interesting that he knew that he was sick in the head. Uh, like, you wouldn't really expect these cycles to know that they, they're out of their mind, you know? Wait. Dahmer even oh, sure. revealed that he knew his time in prison would be hell. I know my time in prison will be terrible, but I deserve whatever I get because of what I have done. He told the court, and it seems he was not wrong. For the first year of his incarceration, Dahmer was placed in solitary confinement due to concerns for his safety. Surprisingly, upon Dahmer's request, he was transferred to a less secure unit. This proved to be the wrong move. On July 3rd... What? It pr like maybe it's the wrong move, but that's probably what he wanted. I'm assuming bro's dead. Yeah, he did, he is probably dead right now. Like he probably wanted to go to like a less secure prison because he wanted to get killed. Like he probably went insane, even more insane in solitary confinement. In 1994, a fellow inmate, Osvaldo Duruthi, attempted to slash Dahmer's throat with a razor embedded in a toothbrush as Dahmer sat in the prison chapel. Yo! Although he survived the attack, he would not be lucky a few months later. On the morning of November 28, 1994, Dahmer was discovered on the floor of the bathrooms of the gym, suffering from extreme head wounds, and was pronounced dead one hour later at a nearby hospital. Fellow inmate Christopher Scarver had used a metal bar to repeatedly hit Dahmer on the head. Did he get killed with gym equipment? What the fuck, bro? Until he was unconscious. Well, Dahmer had known that something like this would happen. According to Dahmer's family, he had long been ready to die and accepted any punishment which he might endure in prison. In fact, during one of the calls he had with the his fuck? mom after the first attempt on his life, he said, It doesn't matter, mom. I don't care if something happens to me. Catherine Knight. Cannibal killer Catherine Knight lives inside the fearsome Silverwater Women's Correctional Center, formerly known as the Mulawa Correctional Center, in western Sydney, where she's known to other inmates as the Nana. We called her the Nana, a former fellow inmate said about Catherine Knight. She is a gentle soul and not a criminal to me. She is a mediator at Mulawa. She's someone who sorted out problems before they got serious. She would pull the girls Wait. in and try to get them to sort out whatever it was before it ended up with someone going into segregation or getting more time added to their sentence. So I just have to say really quick, isn't that kind of crazy? Well, I haven't watched this whole part about Kath Catherine Knight, but isn't that crazy that the people had so many nice things to say about her, yet she still managed to end up in a video like this? It's crazy, bro. It just goes to show you, you don't really know anyone, bro. Trust nobody. People walk around like with personas and shit. You don't know what they got going oh, on. How did Catherine Knight end up in jail? <laughs> what led her to murder and cannibalize her victim? Catherine Knight was born and raised in an unconventional and dysfunctional family environment. Her mother, Barbara Rufin, had been married to Jack Rufin and lived with him in the small town of Aberdeen in New South Wales' Hunter Valley. Unfortunately, Barbara began an adulterous relationship with Ken Knight, a friend and co-worker of her then-husband. When the affair was brought to light, Ken Knight and Barbara were forced to move out of town and live elsewhere. Barbara had four additional children with Ken, including twin girls born in 1955. Catherine was one of these twin daughters. The relationship relationship between Ken and Barbara was not as rosy as everyone thought. Behind the scenes, Ken was a violent alcoholic who would constantly abuse his wife. Barbara, in turn, often told her daughters intimate details of herself and how much she hated men. All this happened when- Wait, let me hear that again. That found- not at- 
healthy. That's a very toxic household to grow up in, but let me just hear that again. Often told her daughter's intimate details of herself and how much she hated men. All this happened when... Oh, she she's telling young girls. Like, she's telling her young daughters, I hate men. That's Catherine crazy. Catherine was still very young, which affected her later on in life. One of the effects is that I she bet. did not have close friends. In fact, apart from her twin sister, the only other person whom Catherine was close to was her uncle, Oscar Knight, a champion horseman who committed suicide in 1969. Catherine even claimed oh that my Oscar's ghost often visited her when she attended Moosewell Brook High School. Wait, Catherine what? Catherine claimed that Oscar's ghost often visited her when she attended Moosewell Brook High School. Catherine became a loner and is remembered by classmates as a bully who stood over small children she was also not the sharpest tool in the shed and had to leave school at 15 years of age without having learned to read or write at 18 years old Catherine met her soon-to-be husband David Stanford Kellett the two got married one year later in 1974 the marriage between the two started off on the wrong foot as Catherine tried to strangle Kellett on their wedding night Catherine later explained on their wedding night fell asleep after only having intercourse three times this was not the end of bro she tried strangling him because he fell asleep after only having sex with her three times on their wedding night. That is ridiculous, bro. <laughs> what am I even watching right now? What the fuck? ...of the violent episodes as on one occasion, a heavily pregnant Catherine burned all of Kellett's clothing and shoes before hitting him across the back of the head with a frying pan simply because he had arrived home late. Kellett couldn't take it... Bro came, bro came home a little bit late. He he came he came home to all of his shit burnt and he get hit in the back of the head with a frying pan. Boom. Have an ass, bro. And eventually left. <laughs> Imagine that. Several men, Catherine That's fucked up though. I don't know. I don't even know why I'm laughing at this shit, bro. I use that shit as some sort of coping mechanism. Whenever I'm uncomfortable, bro, I just laugh and try to make jokes out of shit, bro. Price in 1995. This would turn out to be the worst decision as Catherine's dreadful crime would take place just five years later. As time went by, their relationship started going downhill, partly because of Catherine's rages, which saw her assault Price on a number of occasions. The fighting became even more frequent, and most of his friends would no longer have anything to do with him while they remained together. Finally fed up, Price decided to take action. On the 29th of February 2000, Price stopped at the scone magistrate's court on his way to work and took out a restraining order in an attempt to keep Catherine away from both himself and his children. While he was sleeping, Catherine went to work, stabbing Price 37 times and then expertly flaying his body with her favorite knife. She made a skin suit which she hung from a meat hook and then- What the fuck, bro? Wait, I gotta keep watching though. ...and him and boiled up his head on his kitchen stove with vegetables and gravy. She even set plates with the names of Price's children as she planned to serve his body parts to his children. Kath yo, yo. That is wicked, bro. That is crazy. She was trying to... Yo, that makes me sick to my stomach, fam. Catherine's initial offer to plead guilty to manslaughter was rejected, and she was charged with murdering Price, to which she entered a plea of not guilty. However, as the jury was being selected, Catherine changed her plea to guilty, and the jury was dismissed. Subsequently, Supreme Court Justice Barry O'Keefe handed Knight a life sentence, with no chance of ever being released. Being the first woman killer to be given life without any possibility of parole, the story gripped the nation that even a book about her was written. The book, Green is the new black even details her life inside the fearsome Silverwater women's correctional center as it turns out the prison officers never take their eyes off her and she's not allowed near knives in fact she can't even have a cellmate in case she kills i can't think about anything more evil than that bro that has to be the most fucked up shit i heard in my life bro she tried to serve the man's body parts to his own children bro Hills again. Catherine was stuck in a factory every day from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. making headphones. She's said to be one of the best workers in the headphone factory and commands the top wage. However, according to the book, four guards flank her, watch her every move, and are with her every day. Surprisingly, her behavior behind bars is totally different from what she was in the outside world. She would stop girls stealing from each other and stop girls from fighting, but she never did it by standing over anyone. She never raised her hands to anyone. She was just someone who everyone loved. One inmate said about Catherine while the inmates love and adore her trust nobody bro that's all I have to say bro trust nobody in this world 
The prison guards have a different take on her. She's the top boss of the jail, one officer said. She takes no crap from anyone and absolutely gives it to the guards. If you come in to search her cell, she will stand in front of you with a smug face and scream at you. One thing is for sure, it does seem like a bad idea for anyone to mess with her. Armin Maves. You bet that. The story of Armin Maves is unlike any other cannibal out there. He was not a murderer like the others on this list. We've, we've gone through uh, Catherine Knight and Jeffrey Dahmer and I'm already sick to my stomach, fam. So we have Armin Maves, uh, Nikolai Erling, uh, and then two more. Let's see. His story is one that shook many back in 2001 and sparked off a fiery debate. Armin was born on the 1st of December 1961 and was the only child of Waltrud Maves. He had two older half-brothers from his father's previous relationship with another woman. Unfortunately, his father abandoned him when he was eight, leaving him to be raised by his mother. Armin described himself as feeling very lonesome after the family had fallen apart. In his adolescent years, he became fascinated by the German fairy tale, Hansel and Gretel. This fascination would eventually lead him to commit an unthinkable act that would see him spend a lifetime in prison. For what is the fairy context. tale about? In the fairy tale, Hansel and Gretel are siblings who are abandoned in a forest and fall into the hands of a witch who lives in a gingerbread and candy house. The witch, who has cannibalistic intentions, intends to fatten Hansel before eventually eating him. However, Gretel saves her brother by pushing the witch into her own oven, killing her, and escaping with the witch's treasure. While most children would marvel at the heroics displayed by Gretel to save her brother, Armin's attention was captured by the witch. Something about her wanting to eat the small boy fascinated young Armin, who would harbor the desire to replicate the witch's habit into his adult life. There was just one problem. Armin was not a killer. He did not have it in himself to become violent to satisfy his desires. So, he did the only thing he knew could work. He decided to look for someone who would willingly accept to be killed, and their body cannibalized. Looking for a willing volunteer, Armin posted an advertisement on the then posted by Frankie on November 19th 2001 uh wait Body hold cannibalized on. looking for a I want to see the whole screen Armin I search a young boy between 18 and 25 years old have you a normal body I butchering you and eat your horny so this guy is like I'm super fascinated by this cannibal from this fucking fairy tale but I'm not evil so I'll eat niggas that want to get eaten, bro. Posted an advertisement. What on type the of active twisted shit am I watching, bro? Website, The Cannibal Cafe, a now defunct forum for people with a cannibalism fetish. Armin's advertisement stated that he was looking for a well-built 18 to 25-year-old to be slaughtered and then consumed. Sure enough, Armin had his volunteer. Bernd Jürgen Armando Brandes, a 43-year-old engineer from Berlin, answered the advertisement in March 2001. Interestingly, many other people responded to the advertisement but later grew cold. I'm Frankie from Germany. I will eat you. Please tell me you're high and why. <laughs> White. <laughs> also send me a pic of you. Where are you from? I hope you can come quick. I'm, I am a hungry cannibal. What the fucking... Cold feet and backed out. Armin and Brandes met on the 9th of March 2001 in Armin's home, where they agreed to film the entire gruesome ordeal. They started with Brandes swallowing 20 sleeping pills and a bottle of cough syrup. The two then agreed to cut off Brandes's for them to eat it together. Brandis initially insisted Armin attempt to bite the body part off. This did not work and ultimately Armin used a knife to remove it. Brandis even tried to eat some of it raw but could not because it was too tough and chewy. Armin then fried the body part in a pan with salt, pepper, wine, and garlic. This did not go to plan as it became too burnt to be consumed. He then chopped the- Yo, do niggas watch shit like this, bro? This true crime shit is fucked up, bro. Bro, I'm I'm about to fucking close the video, bro. Real shit, bro. What what is this? The chunks and fed it to his dog. Armin proceeded to run his body. I gotta stop being a bitch. Before going to read a Star Trek book while checking in every 15 minutes. All this time, Brandis lay bleeding in the bath, drifting in and out of consciousness. After long hesitation and prayer, Armin killed Brandis by stabbing him in the throat. After which he hung the body on a meat hook. Armin dismembered and ate the corpse over the next 10 months, storing body parts in his freezer under pizza boxes and consuming up to 20 kilograms grams or 44 pounds of the flesh the incident was recorded on a four-hour videotape which has never been released to the public due to its gruesome contents there is a rumor that four screenshots of the video can be found online but the credibility of the screenshots has never been
been proven. Fascinated by the incident, Armin went back to the internet to look for more volunteers. However, in December 2002, a college student alerted authorities to new advertisements for victims online. German authorities swung into action and searched Armin's home. There, they found body parts and the videotape of the killing, and he was subsequently arrested. Although Armin was diagnosed with a schizoid personality, he was deemed fit to stand trial. On the 30th of January 2004, he was convicted of manslaughter and sentenced to eight years and six months in prison. The case attracted considerable media attention and sparked a debate. Only Many eight people years? questioned whether he belonged in jail since his victim had willingly accepted to be killed and cannibalized. Nevertheless, Armin admitted to cannibalizing Brandes and expressed regret for his actions and he was whisked to jail. Unfortunately, just one year after he began his sentence, a German court ordered a retrial after prosecutors appealed his sentence. They argued that he should have been convicted of murder because he killed for sexual gratification, a motive proved by his having videotaped the crime. The court ruled that the original trial had ignored the significance of the video in disproving the argument that Armin only killed because he had been asked to kill. More bad news followed as at his retrial, a Doesn't matter. stated that Armin could reoffend, as he still had fantasies about devouring the flesh of young people. Now, there was no way the courts would let him go and put the public in danger. And true to that, on the 10th of May 2006, a court in Frankfurt convicted Armin of murder and sentenced him to life imprisonment. While oh, in jail, yeah. Armin became a vegetarian and urged people like him to go for treatment. <laughs> so Wait, hold on. Let me hear While that again. In jail, Armin became a vegetarian and urged people like him to go for treatment. So it doesn't escalate. That's a huge step from cannibal to vegetarian. As it did with him. Since this is a unique case, some prison rules have been relaxed for him. As of 2020, Armin has been allowed to go outside of prison for supervised excursions in disguise around town in a different state. It's crazy how much trust even guards have with him, showing that he was never a violent criminal. Nikolai Jumagaliev from Germany to now Kazakhstan. Nikolai Espolovich Jumagaliev is believed to have killed and cannibalized at least 10 people, targeting mainly women. Shockingly, his atrocities were carried out in a span of only two years, wow. between 1979 and 1980. Nikolai was considered by all who knew him as a well-spoken, clean-shaven gentleman who was always neatly dressed. However, he had one physical flaw that everyone who knew him would look past. He possessed white metal teeth, losing his natural teeth years before. This later earned him the nickname metal fang though not exactly a loner nikolai would generally keep to himself Yo, i ain't gonna lie i'd put girls in my shit bro i'd put diamond girls in my shit bro i'd be smiling all the time <laughs> isn't that crazy bro he was probably insecure about his metal teeth bro people do that voluntarily now in the rap game walking around town trying to meet different women wherever he went his favorite spot in town was near a riverbank where he would meet a young lady and lure her into the dark end of the park nearby there he would then abuse the woman and finish off by hacking the body up with a knife and axe he carried at all times however he wasn't done yet he would then proceed to cook up parts of his victims and eat their flesh the rest he would bag up in a sack and I'm trying to look at other things in the video like I'm not trying to listen to what he's saying because it's so gruesome But do, are the clips in the video? From like actual movies describing what happened or is the guy just using random movie clips? 